Americans aged 18 through 24 hate Jews as much as the Nazis did. The Biden administration is setting Israel up for war crimes charges. And why is it that the Biden administration is siding with Israel's enemies in terms of the substance of his policies on the war between Israel and Hamas? I'll have details on all of that coming up on In Focus. So this week, we've seen a whole slew of polls that show a lot of different things about what's going on in America politically. But one of the most interesting findings of a poll that was carried out by the Harvard-Harris um, polling uh, group is a survey that they took of American sentiments regarding the war between Israel and Hamas, and particularly the data that came through this poll about how Americans aged 18 to 24, that is college-aged Americans, think of Israel and Jews in general. And I just want to point out a couple of the incredible data points that uh, we learned from this. First of all, there's a huge contrast between Americans in general and young Americans. Americans in general overwhelmingly support Israel. 81% uh, of Americans support Israel in the war against Hamas, and some of that support is actually granular and very, very uh, meaningful. But the situation flips when it comes to young Americans between the ages of 18 and 24. And I just want to give you a couple of horrible data points. While three quarters of young Americans, like Americans in general, understand that Hamas carried out a genocidal attack against Israel on October 7th, um, and 66% of young Americans between the ages, again, of 18 and 26, believe that anti-Semitism in the United States is growing, and 70% believe that anti-Semitism is a prevalent force on campuses. And they even you have over 70% of young Americans who believe that calling for the genocide of Jews on campuses is a form of hate speech. The first interesting thing is while they all agree it's a form of hate speech, 53% of Americans between the ages of 18 and 24 think that calls for the genocide of Jews should be permitted on campus. So it's hate speech and it should be permitted. So that's one thing. Another thing, and then it just goes downhill from there. So 67% of Americans aged 18 through 24 say that Jews are an oppressor class, an oppressor class and should be treated as such. And if we all are aware of the way that the, uh, the taxonomy of the, uh, of the woke left, we know that humanity is divided between oppressors and oppressed, and oppressors have to be oppressed so that oppressed can become oppressors. That's essentially what they want to do, so that the people who they define as oppressed can do no wrong, and the people who they define as oppressors can do no right. And I think that that's important because then they go on to explain that Israel, 60% of these kids think that Israel is committing genocide in Gaza, and 76% uh, say that Hamas, on the other hand, is a peace partner, which because they're oppressed, so that means that they must be good. And Israel, because it's the oppressor, must be bad. And maybe the most notable aspect of the entire miserable survey that exposes miserable truths about the uh, youth of the United States and the coming generation of American leaders is that 51% an absolute majority of Americans between the ages of 18 and 24 think that Israel should be annihilated in a final status solution of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. 51% of young Americans aged 18 through 24 think that Israel should be annihilated. So they think it's really hate speech to call for genocide of Jews, but then they support that. So that's 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 sad. And I think we have to put this into perspective because the perspective has to be the probable future of American-Israel ties given the way that the tide in American society is turning away from the United States and away from Israel and away from Jews. So I think these numbers are important. And the fact is that these numbers are also uh, in influencing at a very deep level the policies that we're seeing emanating from the Biden administration towards Israel today. 
And we saw that a lot of young staffers in the White House and the State Department and then across the Biden administration signed petitions demanding that the Biden administration end or massively curtail its support for Israel. We've seen that happening all along. Um, and now I just saw today a, a report that came out in Politico four days ago on December 14th, uh, which says that the Biden administration is actually setting Israel up uh, to be accused of war crimes. The uh, the 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 uh, headline of this Politico story is U.S. has collected intel it could use to judge Israel's conduct of the war. And the uh, then the sub uh, headline is the U.S. has been gathering information about Israel's tactics in Gaza since the start of the war and provided those reports to lawmakers. The opening paragraph is, while American officials say they are not making judgments in real time about whether Israel is abiding by the laws of war, the U.S. has gathered intelligence that might allow it to make such assessments. We remember that President Biden already beginning in his first speech after the slaughter of October 7th, uh, he gave a very pro-Israel speech, a floored speech, an emotional speech about what had happened and American support for Israel and the importance of Israel for Jewish survival. And then he began the hectoring that has become the staple of his administration's position vis-a-vis -vis Israel and his talking points towards Israelis uh, since then, which is that Israel, that the United States expects Israel and its prosecution of the war to abide by the laws of war. And we've spoken about this in the past, that this is a form of gaslighting because Israel, as a matter of course, does uphold the laws of war as uh, we would expect most Western militaries to do, as we expect the U.S. military to do and as it prosecutes its wars on behalf of the American people, and Israel does the same thing. Um, but this constant hectoring is a form of gaslighting because it's slandering Israel, saying, we expect you to do what you're already doing, which means that we don't think you're doing what you're doing, and now you have to prove to us that you're doing what you do as a matter of course because we think that you're not doing it, and we're going to accuse you of not doing it by saying that we expect you to do it. See? That's how it works. So Israel is put under a microscope from the outset, accused um, indirectly by President Biden, already out at the outset of conducting its war against Hamas in an unlawful fashion. And now we find out from Politico that actually they've been spying on Israel and trying to gather dirt on Israel. So it says here, State Department officials are also collecting reports of potential Israeli violations through a system unveiled in August called the Civilian Harm Incident Response Guidance, or CHIRG, according to Josh Paul, who quit the department over concerns about its approach to the war. If you remember when we started getting the first wave of petitions by State Department employees, many of them political appointees, saying that they hate Israel and that the United States should opposed Israel, we had one of them, this man named Josh Paul, coming out and quitting because he said <clears throat> he said that it's calls for the United States to abandon its support of Israel and stand four square with Hamas were not being heeded. So according to Josh Paul, who quit the demonstration over concerns over the administration's approach to the war, Paul said some officials within the department's Bureau of Political Military Affairs, where he worked, have asked state's legal wing to, quote, provide information about their potential international law exposure as a result of approving these sales. So what he's doing now and what uh, his allies inside of the State Department are doing are saying, well, you know, they're saying, well, you know, it's not just that Israel is, a, is, a, <coughs> is, we argue, acting in a criminal fashion in its prosecution of the war, but actually we may be culpable because we're supplying Israel with weapons under American law if we supply weapons to Israel and Israel breaks international law, then we can't give them any more weapons and we may ourselves be liable for charges under the uh, Hague Convention because we're doing this. So, so it's not that the United States is supplying weapons, say, to the Lebanese armed forces and training them when it's a force that's completely controlled by Hezbollah. No, the Israel Defense Force, our military, is now being accused of being a terrorist organization and that by supplying Israel with weapons, the United States is acting as a state sponsor of terrorism. That's effectively with the line that uh, this fella, Josh Paul, and his allies are, uh, are, are peddling. And then it goes on and says, that suggests that when President Joe Biden reiterated Tuesday, that last Tuesday, we discussed this last week, that Israel was using, quote, 
indiscriminate bombing in Gaza, a breach of international humanitarian law, he was likely speaking about information he had. Finally, we know when we look through this, we have to ask ourselves, why are they doing this, right? Why, why are they looking... Why are they looking for dirt on Israel? What kind of ally behaves that way? Well, I mean, if we go back to the Harvard-Harris poll of young Americans, we can see just how virulently the Jew hatred is among, Amer among young Americans, among many of the people, many of the people who harbor these virulently, these really genocidally anti-Semitic views are now seated within the administration. We know we know this for a fact. I mean, we know that Hadi Amar, the senior State Department official who's in charge of U.S. policy towards the Palestinians, supports Hamas. He has a history of statements supporting uh, terrorism, terrorist attacks, suicide bombings against Israel going back over 20 years. So this is a man who's at the helm of American policy towards the Palestinians at the State Department, and he, of course, is far from alone. So we have, we have a situation where the Americans are now not, they present themselves as Israel's ally, but in fact, the administration itself is loaded with people who consider Israel to be the enemy, that Israel is a terrorist organization, not Hamas, like the, like the young people in America think. So this is where it's coming from academia, it's coming from K through 12, it's coming from the universities, it's entering into the bloodstream of American society, and most importantly, it's well represented in the positions held by key officials in the Biden administration. So that's where it's coming from, and how is this being translated into the policies of the Biden administration, which is the last thing that I wanted to talk about with you. So we've had just this um, express train constantly coming of senior administration officials to Israel to hector us, to talk to us about how we have to curtail our military operations in, Ga in Gaza and not take action against uh, the Houthis. Jake Sullivan was the first one to arrive, national security advisor. He was here at the end of last week, and he spent most of the meetings that he had with his Israeli counterparts, with Prime Minister Netanyahu, with the uh, War Cabinet, with President Herzog, with anybody else, with the Israeli media, talking about how the United States wants Israel to end its major combat operations in Gaza and limit its continued operations in Gaza to sort of pinpoint uh, commando-style attacks that are targeting specifically uh, Hamas terror masters like Yahya Sinwar and Mohammed Def. One of the things is that they're constantly dangling the possibility of a UN Security Council resolution passing with the United States not vetoing it that will require a ceasefire. So last week they vetoed, this week the UAE is pushing another one that the United States is not negotiating, it may veto, it may accept. So it's using the, the first of all, it's using the UN Security Council sort of as a cudgel trying to push Israel. They're saying, our continued support for your military operations in Israel is contingent on you allowing more and more and more humanitarian aid into Gaza. So one of the key demands that Sullivan had when he was here was that he demanded that Israel open up its crossing point into Gaza to allow trucks of supplies to move into Gaza directly from inside of Israel. Until now, all of the humanitarian trucks that are entering Israel into Gaza are going through Egypt and not going through Israel. Um, so Israel dutifully bowed to the demand, thinking, well, it's better for us to do this than to stop fighting, and started opening up a Kerem Shalom crossing at the end of last week to please Jake Sullivan. Okay. Now, I think it's very important for us to just spend a little bit of time talking about what humanitarian aid means, okay? We've spoken about it before, but I want to go into it a little bit more um, granularly because it does a few things here that cause that undermine Israel's war effort, both strategically and tactically. And it's very important for us to recognize it because while it sounds like a nice concept, humanitarian aid, we want to help civilians, we want to help women and children. You know, we, we think we hear humanitarian aid, we think baby formula. Um, it's really the exact opposite of humanitarian aid. And I, and again, I talked about this in my article, but I think it's important to spell it out here as well. So humanitarian aid going through Gaza, first of all, 
maintains Hamas's control over the population of Gaza in a very direct way. Why is that? Because Hamas is still in charge of Gaza. So whether it goes through Rafiah or it goes through Kerem Shalom, the people who are in control of where that where the trucks that have medical supplies and food and fuel um, go are Hamas terrorists. And so they divert all of these trucks, first and foremost, to supply themselves, to supply their terrorists, to supply their terrorist units, supply their terrorist cells, to supply their tunnels. Israel just uncovered a massive four kilometer uh, uh, tunnel right uh, that reaches almost into Israel by the Arabs crossing in northern Gaza yesterday. So they have a massive complex that underneath the ground Gaza uh, that houses Hamas's entire military industrial com uh, capabilities and its military, its terrorist army. And the, the dimensions of this thing are only now becoming clear to Israel just how massive it is. We've just also found out that Hamas started planning the operation of October 7th in 2015 through uh, internal documents that, that the IDF forces took control over over a couple of days ago. So they get to decide where all this uh, aid goes, and it goes first to them when they're done with their share, when they have what they need, and of course they'll get more tomorrow. They let the aid go to their apparatchiks, to their loyalists, anybody who feeds them, anybody who helps them, anybody who gives them information, anybody who works for them, and their families and their friends, right, and their their clans. So they give it to their supporters. And only after that, then the then the aid, the humanitarian aid, right, these uh, the flour and water and whatever it is that's coming in, food, um, it's sold, it's hawked in black markets by hawkers at a massive markup, sometimes 500, sometimes 1,000 percent, to the civilians who are supposed to be uh, the initial recipients or the sole recipients of the so-called humanitarian aid. But since Hamas controls the population, Hamas controls who gets fed. And that that continued control over the supplies that the Americans are enabling by demanding that Israel have these humanitarian aid convoys coming in, we're talking about hundreds and hundreds of trucks a day going into Gaza, the United States is ensuring that Hamas continues to maintain its absolute control over the population of Gaza. Okay, there's another thing that it does, which is that it keeps the population in Gaza. So we know that Egypt's position has been, we won't let them into the Sinai. We're not going to let them into the Sinai. They pose their Muslim Brotherhood. They pose a direct threat to the Egyptian regime. We're not going to let them into Gaza. And they closed off the Rafah crossing and they... We're putting up a big concrete wall to block them, blast walls to block them from coming in. Okay, and they have a lot of forces deployed. They don't want them in Egypt. But they started talking a week and a half ago about finally letting them go to third countries, Turkey, Qatar, Chechnya, lots of countries who like Nazis and they're willing to take them and they want them. And they would take them and these people can at least be out for the duration of the war so that Israel can operate more freely and uh, be free to... Uh, defeat Hamas in, a, in an easier fashion. But the United States ignored all of that and in fact went against what seemed to be the beginning incipient Egyptian willingness to let these people leave by uh, doubling down on its demand that Israel open up Kerem Shalom. The other thing that the United States does by opening up Kerem Shalom is that it forces Israel to accept continued responsibility for the Nazi jihadist population inside of Gaza, because the 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 advantage of aid coming in through Rafiah is that it under it through through Egypt is that it assumes that Israel isn't going to be responsible, that there will be no connection between Israel and Gaza going forward. The fact that the United States is demanding that the aid go through Israel itself means that the United States continues to view Israel as a so-called occupier. We have to take care of the enemy population inside of Gaza. You know, on that score, in terms of, you know, the people of Gaza, that we had a, uh, a channel, uh, t uh, Israel Channel 12, had a very long interview with one of the hostages that was released. Her name is Doron Katzashel, and she and her two-year-old and four-year-old daughters were held hostage in Gaza for 50 days, and they were let out in the previous uh, swap for hostages for terrorists. And her mother was taken with them, and she was killed. And so Doron and her two daughters were held in Gaza. And one of the most notable aspects of 
of the conversation, which itself was extraordinary, was that she was talking about how terrified she was of of the Palestinian civilians because she they wanted every every contact that she had with normal Gazans. Uh, she felt that her life was under imminent threat and that of her children as well. And so she described two different scenes, one when they were being moved from their initial place where they were being held in an apartment to uh, one of the hospitals where they were moved to, where they were held um, as terrifying because she kept being afraid that the people passing them on the street would find out that they were Israeli, that one of her daughters would speak to her in Hebrew or cry out in Hebrew, and they would be lynched. The second time was when they were handed off from Chabas to uh, the Red Cross, and they had to get out of the Hamas vehicle and walk to the Red Cross vehicle when they were being released. And there was a massive mob of Gazans there who were threatening to kill the hostages as they were being released to the uh, to the International Committee of the Red Cross. And she said that she was afraid to leave the Hamas vehicle and walk the several meters to the to the Red Cross uh, van because of the people outside. So that you know, when we're talking about the innocent civilians of Gaza, we have to understand that these people are, in fact, dedicated to and enthusiastically support the annihilation of Israel and the murder of Jews. And what the United States is saying by demanding that Israel open up Karim Shalom to uh, to humanitarian aid to Hamas is that Israel has to accept responsibility, ongoing, continuous responsibility for these people. And that's important to note. And then the, the, the last thing that we have to understand is that by, uh, by forcing Israel to do this, oh, and by the way, like right after Israel opened up Karim Shalom, the United States said, great, now that they've done this, they can open up Gaza to commercial traffic. So they want life to go on as usual is pre-October 7th in Gaza, while Hamas is still in charge, while we have hundreds of thousands of IDF forces in jeopardy in Gaza, in harm's way, on, in the combat, you know, in combat in Gaza. They want life to go on as normal. And that's the last thing, which is that, you know, from a tactical perspective, the situation on the ground now is that the United States is demanding that Israel fight in southern Gaza in the presence of hundreds of thousands of civilians in the middle of towns that are filled with civilians. The United States is saying to Israel, no, you can't move anybody out of these battle spaces. They all have to be allowed to remain in place. You're not allowed to take anybody out of their homes to move anybody. And by the way, the places that the Gazans from northern Gaza moved to, the humanitarian safe zones, those are being used by Hamas to shoot re- weapons and to shoot um, missiles into Israel. I think there have been 17 or 20 missile attacks on Israel from the humanitarian safe zones already. Oh, and then the last thing that the United States is saying to Israel, and this is just, you know, the demand that we see from the people tracking us for war crimes and going down from Biden to the last of them, is that Israel has to reduce to near zero the number of civilian casualties. And every civilian casualty is chalked up, now we know, by the intel gatherers who are trying to, who are trying to frame Israel. <coughs> We know that any civilian ch- casualty is being chalked up by the intel gatherers who are trying to frame Israel of war crimes as a war crime. So this is the operational environment that hundreds of thousands of IDF regular uh, service uh, soldiers and reservists are being forced to fight in inside of Gaza. So you can't leave. You, the civilians aren't going to leave. The United States is forcing Israel to resupply Hamas giving Hamas continued uh, control over the civilian population and telling Israel you're not allowed to kill anybody. And yes, it's true, Hamas is using his civilians as, as human shields, but tough luck, you just have to deal with that because you have to be better than Hamas. And this then brings us to you know the other areas, right? So you have two major shipping um, companies, the, um, uh, Evergreen and the... Uh, and a Hong Kong-based one that are saying, um, no, we can't, we can't uh, ship anything in or out of Israel anymore. You have five major shipping companies, including Maersk, saying that they're not going to travel through uh, the Red Sea any longer. So you have a full-blown maritime embargo of Israel 
And the United States said to Israel, don't retaliate. And in fact, the United States itself hasn't retaliated. On Saturday, the United States intercepted 13 separate drone attacks and the British Navy intercepted a 14th one, all shot by the Houthis at commercial shipping in the Red Sea. On Monday, uh, an oil tanker and another cargo uh, ship were both attacked by the Houthis. They're massively escalating their attacks on international shipping uh, in the Bab el Mandab choke point um, because they can, and they are. And the United States, rather than uh, enabling Israel, allowing Israel, permitting Israel to bomb, say, the ports of Yemen where from which these Houthi pirates are operating, saying, no, 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 don't retaliate. And then the United States itself isn't retaliating. Why? Because the United States says they don't want to provoke a regional war. And in fact, that's the goal of Secretary of Defense Lloyd Austin's trip here is to block regional war and to build an international coalition of the United States and Jordan with its great you know, Navy and, um, and Bahrain and other countries that are going to somehow or another interdict the Houthis but not expand the war. So there's really no way... This is not a serious effort, or it doesn't seem to be. You know what? The jury's out. Maybe it's serious. I find it hard to believe. But most importantly, this is a coalition that the Americans are putting together that they're not going to allow Israel to participate in. So Israel is the primary victim of the Houthis. The United States is putting together a whole coalition that may or may not do something. My money is on not, but whatever. And they're saying, Israel, you're not allowed to participate in this. And then you know, some talk in Israel was like, well, maybe this is a good thing because the Saudis are going to be involved. But apparently the Saudis aren't going to be involved because the Saudis just advanced their peace talks with Iran under the auspices of China. They signed another deal for a partnership. And as a result of this, as a result of Chinese diplomacy bringing the Saudis and the Iranians together, the Saudis don't want to participate in operations against the Houthis, who are, again, uh, choking off maritime travel um, in the uh, Bab el Mandab in the Red Sea and have instituted an illegal uh, blockade of uh, the port of Eilat through the Bab el Mandab. <coughs> Finally, of course, we have Lebanon. Sullivan gave an interview to Yonid Levy of Channel 12 while he was here, and uh, she asked him about Lebanon, and he said, well, you know, we, we support a diplomatic solution to the problem with Lebanon. Now, Lebanon is a military problem. It's not a diplomatic problem. How do you solve a military problem where you have Hezbollah, an Iranian terror army, perched on Israel's border with uh, battle-hardened troops that have been trained to conquer uh, the Galilee? Um, and they're standing on the fence. And Israel is being subjected to a significant and steadily escalating missile and rocket assault on its sovereign territory from Lebanon. So far, the United States has forced Israel again, coerced Israel like it always does into um, essentially standing down and not, not responding except to the direction that we're being fired at. So not taking any preemptive action, preemptive and it is hardly the word when you're already under attack, but taking any strategic action against Hezbollah can, that could that could significantly degrade its ability to attack Israel. Um, no, we're not allowed to do that. We have to respond with pinpoint accuracy, try to intercept their rockets en route, and if not, then you know just respond fire to uh, the places where the attack came from. So this is a military threat. Not only do they have the forces on our border, but they have, of course, the 150,000 missiles, rockets, and, uh, and mortars directed at Israeli territory. As we said repeatedly, because it's important, uh, these can attack every single place inside of sovereign Israeli territory, and the United States wants to solve this with a diplomatic solution, not by supporting Israel, which they don't, but by telling Israel you're not allowed to respond with force because we want a diplomatic solution. What's the diplomatic solution that the United States wants? <laughs> it wants Israel to agree to... Uh, a fiction. The fiction is that, as we discussed at the outset, that the Lebanese armed forces is not a Hezbollah-controlled um, military, but it actually operates independently when it is a well-known fact that the Lebanese armed force has no ability, no power to independently operate in Lebanon without Hezbollah 
uh, approval. Um, and that uh, any time that they have, the rare instances where they tried to do so in the past, the Lebanese forces involved were killed. And therefore, anybody who might even want to think about doing so would never even bother at this point. <laughs> All the same, the American policy vis-a-vis -vis Lebanon is based on this fictional idea that the LAF, as it's called, is an independent fighting force. And what the United States wants Israel to do is accept two things. One is that Hezbollah will be pushed away from the border by the LAF, okay? So that the LAF is going to secure the border from Hezbollah, which controls the LAF. That's the first thing that the United States wants Israel to accept. And the second thing that Israel wants is Amer uh, what wants um, the Americans want Israel to accept is this idea that the border between Israel and Lebanon requires correction um, to Lebanon's benefit. When Israel withdrew all of its forces from uh, its security zone in southern Lebanon and withdrew to the international border, the it, it was in a painstaking and often humiliating process. UN observers walked uh, centimeter by centimeter across the border with Israel with maps and said, here you have to move the the fence, uh, you know, three centimeters to the right because you're... you're uh, you're in Lebanon, and, and you're supposed to start, Israel's supposed to start three centimeters uh, to the right of where you demarcated your territory. And Israel did this. And the uh, and at the time, the UN approved that Israel had, in fact, withdrawn in 2000 to the international border. But now, um, but since then, and uh, Hezbollah insisted that, no, this was wrong. The UN delineation of the international border was wrong. We have territorial claims. That's why we're continuing to attack Israel, because Israel is, is in control of areas that belong to Lebanon. Now, Lebanon actually has no international legal claim to any of these areas. Again, the UN approved that Israel had withdrawn in 2000, but that doesn't stop Hezbollah. So now what the United States wants to do as part of its diplomatic solution is not only for Israel to accept this fiction that the LAF will be there and Hezbollah won't be there, but also for Israel to accept all of Hezbollah's illegal uh, ungrounded territorial demands on Israel that it's been making, that it began making only after Israel withdrew to the international boundary in in uh, in 2000 to maintain a, a fake causes belly to allow them to continue to maul Israel with missiles and with terrorists uh, following Israel's withdrawal from 2000. So this is what we're facing, and the United States is now saying, ah, we don't support war, we support a diplomatic solution. The solution is for Israel to surrender to all of Hezbollah's demands. So if we put together the Harvard poll, the Harvard-Harris poll, that shows that young Americans are displaying Nazi-like hatred of Jews and willingness and support for the annihilation of the Jewish state, and we add to that the way that people with these kinds of views have seated themselves inside of the Biden administration, we end up with this policy of the Biden administration, which on the one hand taps its head to the vast majority of Americans who support Israel but substantively, sub substantively are standing with the Israel haters, the Jew haters on, in the 18 to 24 age group and within the administration itself, who by adapting policies that are geared towards Israel losing. And, and in the column that I wrote today, I said, what is Israel supposed to do under the circumstances? And I think that Israel has to make its case in a more significant way to the American people. I think that Prime Minister Netanyahu has to give a speech at some point soon as we see the tensions, the violence, the combat escalating along the border with Lebanon uh, that explains the truth about Lebanon, that tells the truth about Lebanon, that there is no independent Lebanese army. The Americans are accusing Israel of killing Lebanese uh, soldiers who, of course, were operating with Hezbollah along the border. And this is like a bad thing. I guess they're trying to say that we're breaking international law. Um, but, he, you know, it has to be spelled out, the actual nature of this place called Lebanon, which is really Iran's forward base in its war to annihilate Israel that's controlled by its Lebanese foreign legion called Hezbollah, the party of God. So we have to tell the truth about what's happening. We should tell the truth about humanitarian aid. And we should tell the truth about the Houthis and what they're doing to Israel's economy. You know, we're looking forward to an economic meltdown probably at the end of the world, though I think a lot of good things will happen if we actually, God willing, actually win. But, uh, you know, the, the 
government is spending on this war. It's like a drunken soldier, so, drunken sailor, and we're going to have massive deficits, which are going to cause massive inflation. So, you know, we're not looking at a good horizon, really, for our economy going forward. But, you know, when you add to that this maritime blockade of our coast and America's allowing this to happen and blocking us from defending uh, the the safe patches of goods um, on, on this uh, key waterway to Israel and really to the Suez Canal uh, and to the world, um, you see what happens when the American colossus just sort of shifts and moves to stand with the other side. Um, and Israel has to point these things out. You know, we have to stand up. We have to take advantage of the fact that although the 18 to 25-year-olds don't like Jews, uh, most Americans are not anti-Semites. The vast majority of Americans support Israel, and they have to be given the opportunity to stand with Israel. I think that if this happens and you develop a political dynamic inside of the United States, then makes it more difficult as a practical matter for Biden to be implementing these policies that are extremely dangerous. They're dangerous for America as well. I mean, the, the, the deal with the Houthis, I mean, that's basically a renunciation of 200 years of American maritime policy. I mean, the doctrine of the U.S. Navy has been to protect the uh, sh safe shipping on the high seas. That's That was the reason it was established under Thomas Jefferson and the Barbary Pirates War, because the pirates, very much like the Houthis today, were seizing American merchant vessels and taking American sailors hostage and then demanding ransom for their freedom. And this is very similar to what we're seeing the Houthis do today. And yet, whereas Stephen Decatur went to the shores of Tripoli uh, to fight the Barbary pilots, pirates, here we're seeing Lloyd Austin coming to Israel and telling us not to do the same thing, and America just sort of taking it on the chin. So, you know, those are, that's where the war stands right now. We're going to have to see what happens because Israel simply can't allow this to go on. I mean, the one thing that Israel has going for it is that the public and the government see very eye to eye on this. We all saw what happened on October 7th. We understand that this is a war for Israel's very survival. And with all due respect to the United States, and there's an enormous amount of uh, reservoir of goodwill towards the United States, um, Israelis can't accept anything short of a victory, certainly not in Gaza, and certainly not, by the way, in Lebanon as well, or in the Red Sea, for that matter. And it would be great if the United States was acting as the ally that it presents itself to be, um, and hopefully um, it will uh, when the majority of Americans who support Israel are are able to make that uh, position clear in, in a significant way. And I think that Israel should probably enable or help them to realize what's at stake uh, it, as time goes on and the stakes become more dangerous for our troops, for our country, for our economy, and for our survival. So those are my thoughts today, and I'll see you again later this week. Take care.